w welcome one and all. We're going to do this uh, this um, this uh, Q and A session. Uh, with us is um, is uh, the SOG legend himself, uh, John Stryker Meyer, former one zero of uh, Recon Team Idaho, um, who's helped us design the game and is a character in the game. Um, and uh, watching us today, Tilt is um, that's his nickname for anyone that doesn't know that yet. Probably all should. I'd be fun to hear you and dummy. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, so uh, watching us is um, probably several thousand uh, people watching the streams uh, from some of the guys streaming today. And as you heard, we've we've raised eight and a half k to to support the uh, Dick's Arsenal system and the MVG wow. charity. Over to you, Tilt, with the first question. How big is your DC DLC team? And that was All asked right. by by Supernova. Um, and uh, horrible goat's going to answer it. Yeah, so we have about uh, 50 people in the core team and then 50 people in uh, as, as, as like occasional people, part-time part -time people, and then about 50 people who have, who have retired. So overall, the team has been about 150 people. Really? In, in the three years we have been making the DLC. Wow. And... Um, the 50 people in the core team has uh, have produced uh, about 80 percent of the of all of the content. So the turnover, while it has been quite big, uh, the, the core people have stayed for a long time. Yeah, and we're all really sick of each other. <laughs> <laughs> no, we love each other. Well, we're like a big yeah, family. Yeah. Good I have enough here. for everyone. You're very impressive, I'll tell you that. <laughs> Thank you, Tilt. Okay, so that's that one. Um, what's what's question two then? Let's just Number start. two is a lot of DLC devs had worked on the Onsung Vietnam War mod. How many things from it went into the DLC? Right, so... Uh, people may not realize is that um, some of us worked on the Unsung mod for, uh, well, I did for seven years, but it's been going for nearly 20 years now since Operation Flashpoint, the very first version of armor that came out. Um, and uh, we were not allowed because of licensing to take any assets from from the free content in the mod. Um, so basically everything you see in the DLC was built from scratch. But of course, we took a lot of experience uh, that we'd built up over the years. And in the team here, we've got people from uh, a vast array of mod teams. We've got Dennis from JSRS uh, Sound uh, Mod, you know, uh, and then Icebreaker and Temper. With mods. We've got the Anti Stasi, some team members, the KP Liberation team members, Jets DLC team members, people from all over uh, the armor community. So there was a huge amount of knowledge and experience that came from those teams into the DLC, which is why we achieved the quality we did that we're very happy with. Um, but obviously, we didn't take anything at all from Unsung, so so there's nothing. It's completely separate. All right, very good. Number three, how did you convince SOG veterans to collaborate? Was it based on your charitable support to help vets? Well, um, Till, as you will know, we, we didn't start any charitable work until uh, recently, uh, you know, when you asked us to work to reach out to Dick uh, last year. Um, so really, I think... Um, from Ken's point of view, it was about um, telling the stories of the South Vietnamese, Montagnards, and Nungs, uh, Cambodians uh, that you guys worked with, and, and the King Bees, of course, and the M. And, um, the but what clinched it for you? Part of uh, for me, it was um, the fact that we could talk about, and there have been other video games that pretended to be SOG that did not have the quality of the video games that Armour had produced. And uh, your quality level was just much higher. It was dedicated to true stories. And uh, that's why I joined on uh, when you asked me to help out. And um, it was strictly get the stories out. It's a different um, way of uh, getting the stories out to the, to the world. And it's an opportunity to work with fellow veterans. It's really just cool at many different levels. And it's nothing to do with the case of whiskey uh, we sent you. <laughs> well, my wife is she's that whiskey drinker around here, so <laughs> she she was grateful for that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, good one. Okay, so we're on to the next question. How did one... the veterans at the SOA reunion react to the final product? Ah. And 
bird, uh, everybody was either amazed or or just blown away by it. It was just such a um, for old guys like us, also old grayheads who had never seen a computer game in the last twenty years. What you had done here was incredible. I mean, everybody was like awestruck. Incredible work. I mean, I just can't find enough superlatives. And you, and uh, any of our guys There's you so talked to, to would say the same thing. Um, it generated a lot of interest. And, of course, we had our favorite rotorhead there, Don Haas, and he was taking people over. Anybody hadn't seen it, and uh, Don was doing a great job that way. Yeah, fab. And the year before, um, I went to the virtual saw. I think I think you. I'm not sure if you were there for that or all of it. For your part, yes, sir. Yeah, you were. Yeah, yeah. Of was, course, you I were. was virtually yeah. there. <laughs> yeah, so I was I was dragged onto the main stage with 50 SOG uh, veterans, um, and I didn't know I was going to do this. And they said, "Show us your game," and and I just had to, you know, this was before release, and I'm not allowed to show it to anyone. So. I said, uh, you guys can keep a secret, right? You know, and everyone cracked <laughs> up. <'cause... laughs> yeah, for 30 years, yeah. no problem. Right? No kidding. Um, and so I, I, took, I took the guys for a walk through FOB1 and showed them around the hoochies. And, you know, and the, I heard an audible sort of intake of breath, you know, a gasp as I walked into one of the team hoochies. And, the, and I heard a guy just say, it was just like that in wonder. And I, and I, yeah. thought, I thought, we've nailed it, you know, at that point, because... For the guys to have that reaction of, you know, and they were saying, turn right, that's the Sergeant Major's hooch. You know, like they recognized FOB1 cool. when we walked around it. So I thought that was pretty cool. Amazing. Absolutely. Okay, on to the next one then. Just keep yes, rolling. Yes, the next question. What's your favorite weapon to run recon in game? Let's roll around the team on this. Uh, the fact, that's asked by the big man. That's for the team to answer. Yes, sir. I, I um, guess for me, I would say probably the M60 or the RPD because I love shooting a lot. <laughs> how so, how many you? rounds did you carry when you were carrying the RPD? As much as I can, and it's never enough. Never enough. <laughs> how about veteran? Yeah, for me, it would be RPD shorty because shooting with working iron sights is too easy in armor, so carry as much ammo. And yeah, shoot. It's got to be the M14. Like I tried most of, I think all of the guns in the DLC now, and I just keep coming back to it because Dennis did such a good job on the sound designs. It's so satisfying to fire. The and... M14. Ah, yeah, go. <laughs> yeah, yeah, go. Uh, I like the M63A. Uh, it's well, I'm I'm just from the, the aesthetic point that it's very unique looking and pretty well inspired by the stuff. Like I'm sorry, look at it when I carry it in the game. That's the stoner, so don't don't yeah. tell Tilt because that's a seal gun. <laughs> <laughs> well, it's, it's, it's been traded, you know. Yeah, we did have the the stoner. We looked at it, but we knew it would take a while to get the weapons and enough ammo to get them uh, aboard. And we were up and running with the Car 15 and a sawed off M79, and a few guys were carrying the M60. But uh, we in the in '68 we were just Car 15s. Right, and I think for me, um, I I love battlefield pickup, so I'll pick up any weapon and use it. Uh, you know, a Chinese, <laughs> a Chinese, French weapons, like anything. But my personal favourite is the sawn off M seventy nine because uh, that's a game changer and it's very oh, quick to use. Thumper, yeah, yeah. <laughs> we we asked Ken favorite. the other day at the end of a mission, we're flying back, and I Thumper asked Ken, the "What's the shortest range you ever use that uh, for real?" And he said, 20 meters." Really? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Twenty wow. meters with an HE round. Yeah. So <laughs> that's. That, I mean, that that made everyone on the helicopter go, "Oh my lord!" Because that's yeah. danger close. <laughs> that that's you know you know that you're in the in the proverbial at that point. So uh, good. All right. Great question. Let's keep moving. Okay. Number six. Was there anything in your plans that you couldn't develop? Due to engine limitations, and this is uh, to Horrible Goat, Veteran, and Spuffy. This is from Scarecrow1625. Quite a lot of uh, ideas, naturally. Um, 
female characters is one shorter indie characters uh, they have some difficulties in in the engine so and and they are pretty difficult to create so so that unfortunately didn't make the make the cut in the in the in the planning stage and how about that hmm, i guess for the tracker model when the avalanche hits you i initially wanted to have vehicles also being used by nva but uh, the map of finding and physics just couldn't let me use vehicles in the jungle path finding's pretty tough you know, too. flying btrs and tanks and uh, <laughs> stuck on, on their trees so i guess that's that's this yeah and and spoffy i feel like veteran stole my answer though like <laughs> It's, it's got to be the vehicles and the AI again, because trying to get reliable pathfinding, you can send them off from point A, and they may never arrive at point B, and there's just not a lot you can do with that from a from design angle. Yeah, even if there's a road from point A to B, they can just wander into the jungle instead of using the road and get stuck in the tree. It's not optimal. I, I wanted string extractions and thick triple yeah. canopy jungle yeah. on a on a twenty by twenty map, which uh, you know. That's a String extractions would never work um, and, uh, in the current engine, and the triple canopy jungle, uh, you could do it on a small map, but on a big map like that, it's impossible. To make yeah, it yeah, we, we had to optimize the jungle so that there's, there's still, it is still playable, AI can navigate it, and, and, and um, the object yeah, count doesn't go, go the roof, so, so the FPS stays pretty stable in the jungle. But it, we we tried it at Thicker at some point and you know, it just it didn't work. So we're, we're on a bit of a downer here. So what's the next question then? Then tilt. I think that's the next question is: um, <laughs> Is there anything you regret while making the DLC? The question was asked by Mitchell to the team. Uh, I was just screaming that we just announced the DLC. I was so happy because three years working on this in secret and finally telling everyone uh, that there's, it, there's just reason to be proud of, I think. Any regrets from you, Don? Oh, uh, well. More snakes? <laughs> uh, nothing on the project itself. All that was handle quite well. I honestly have any regrets. It's not managing my time better so that I could spend more time with friends and loved ones before life-changing events. I think amen. <laughs> amen, brother. And I think yeah. we, we all had the same, <laughs> to be honest. But friends and family took a bit of a backseat for all of them. You live with the repercussions. Yeah, yeah. I'm sure you're, a, you're, a, you're a well versed in that. So uh, what's the next one? Go on. Well, we're on it. Okay, next question. Mitchell is back again with another good one. How often did you disagree with each other on different things <laughs> during the development and why? I'm seeing a trend here. And he's asking that for the veteran and for horrible goat. Well, within the terrain team, we worked pretty separately. So, so if there were any disagreements, they would come up in the time when every, everyone's work were put together. And for a while, well, if if someone had accidentally done work on someone else's area, that, that might cause some issues on whose work are we going to use. But but uh, other than that, I, I don't think we had like, like that that big of big of differences in in, in the workflow. But and uh, well, uh, everyone who's who had a problem we always sold that and then the workflow and all the process was refined through that so that that's it's not a, like a bad thing to have the disagreements uh, i think i miss our thursday evening um, terrain meetings they were they were a great fun uh, oh yeah i still have the uh, calendar <laughs> notification it, it pops up every thursday and i'm like oh <laughs> Adrenaline spike, yeah. <laughs> you know, at the uh, at the Washington Post, they used to call that creative tension. There's plenty of that tilt. So, um, <laughs> what, what, yeah. one thing, my sort of row answer on that is there's there's never one way to approach something, and in armor, there's usually only one optimized outcome, and that you know 
you need inquiry, debate, and experimentation to get to that one outcome. That's kind of my written answer on the question. Um, it, you know, in reality, uh, we would generally uh, just troubleshoot and experiment, and explore, and and work out. But we would always, most of us, I would say, uh, be aiming for that one goal of of having a, a functioning, optimized uh, system. Uh, so somebody would write something. Yeah, and that's the thing. Somebody would write something, and Spoffy or Veteran would write rewrite it to make it work better. So yeah, it happened a bit. <laughs> yeah. As for the campaign team, I guess we didn't have much disagreement because it was only me and Christian working on the missions, and we are very like-minded. So after a short discussion, we were able to agree on how to do something. It was very smooth in, in our case. Yeah, out of all the teams I managed, you were the smoothest. I would say uh, in terms of uh, you just got on with it. There was never yeah, a, ra like, a raised like voice. Single brain, basically, me and him. But yeah, it's a good question because you know you bring a team together of guys who've never worked together. Um, uh, well, you know, some of us had, but not not many. Um, and then and then put us under extreme pressure for long periods yeah. of time. And uh, you know, we did well to to get where we got to really, and still be friends at the end of it. You know? I pay that's, them to be my friend. Yeah, you know, that's the thing that. The people see the game, they're not aware of all the time and effort you all put in on that. I mean, three years is a hell of a commitment. And you see the finished product, it's bigger. Uh, how many hundreds of people had to work on it to get it done, to get it done right, the way you've done it with the detail, the depth, uh, when, the, when the games are going down. I don't care. It's amazing. So a hats off to you all, for sure. Thank you, Tilt. Yeah, thanks, Tilt. If you don't mind, I'd like to. Uh, yeah, go on. Uh, I'd like go to on, also extend, say that it's not just uh, people who develop, develop content, assets, and things like that. There's also a lot going on behind the scenes with IT stuff, technical, people who keep everything organized and the machine running. So they definitely deserve some kudos. Yeah. Airborne. <laughs> yeah. Big team. They're our, our King Bee pilots, basically. Yeah. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> I yes. My camera. Okay, on to the next one, too. On to the next Number one. Number nine. When did you know you had something special? The question was asked by Sharp. Mm. He directed it to the team. Uh, jump in, guys. Uh, I think it was when the veterans started joining in. When, they, when we started actually talking with them, when they started jo joining the conversation with us, that, yeah, that was... Everything changed there, I think, because uh, it started to look even more serious than it already was. At least that's for me. Sure changed my life getting to talk to these guys well, and their great. stories. Sorry, go, go ahead. ahead. Oh, go on. I was going to say, it was great fun hopping into like Saturday Mike Force testing sessions um, yes. just after we'd pushed uh, uh, some new content, maybe some new weapons, some new vehicles, and like the first 20 minutes, 30 minutes of the session would people just be ogling and playing with the new toys. And that was always incredibly fun and, and, and satisfying to see. Yeah, I, I sat down with uh, General Bore um, in Wales uh, when he was over visiting uh, UK Special Forces. And, and um, for about 90 minutes, uh, we went up to talk about contracts and we spent 90 minutes talking about NBA tactics. And uh, we were literally finishing each other's sentences. So um, it was just like we were singing completely off the same hymn sheet. and. That's when I realized uh, that we had done enough of our homework to know that we could hold it with a with a SOG one zero, um, and and he would he saw exactly what you know that we saw his experiences as he saw them, uh, and, you know, and he's finishing my sentences, and at the end of it, he said, "What a fantastic meeting!" Because we just knew we you know we both just knew we, this was the right thing to do. We were we were on the same page and. I just thought, as long as that's good, everything else will follow, and you know it'll be good. You made a big impression on him, that's for sure. <laughs> Positive. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's all that arm twisting, but no, he's stronger than me, so I, d I doubt that. <laughs> <laughs> but, but yeah, I mean, flying the Cobra the first time, uh, that thing came out the out the gate like a race car on steroids, and uh, and I was just like punching the air. That was fantastic. Uh, really nice experience. Yeah, I've flown in the front seat of a Cobra twice, and each experience was just phenomenal. And then wow. compared to flying, that. I was allowed to fly co-pilot on a couple of gunships 
when we were uh, we had the monsoons, we couldn't yeah. go run missions. So we loaded up the gunship and go out to the South China Sea and look for uh, NVA supplies coming down through those little dinghy boats, and we'd fire them up, man. <laughs> but over was something else. It was a big difference. You just feel like uh, all the weapons and everything. It was fun. I imagine it's like riding around in the palm of God's hand. Oh, absolutely. And not quite as much fun as it can be, nor as challenging, but <laughs> you did feel like the power of God in your right hand. That's for sure going that trigger finger. <laughs> sure. Thanks, Till. And anybody so cool. else uh, has a good memory of uh, realizing what we'd made? For Can me, I it was pretty three? light. Oh. Yeah, sorry. Uh, for me, no, it was pretty, ahead. pretty light. Uh, I'm I'm really hard to satisfy when it comes to Arma, Arma work. So I think it was only after I was seeing that the player base was really enjoying the game. So it was only after the release. And I, I saw all the reviews, positive reviews, and people saying the missions are awesome, assets are awesome, and they fucking enjoyed it. Yeah. So much to us. So much. I, I saw we had something special. Uh, I, I, I think I was more optimistic in the in the beginning than maybe maybe others that when I saw saw the lineup of our of our team and and the plan and and that this this project had been accepted as a as a CDLC, uh, that was kind of like a like a moment that I was thinking that this is going to be special. So so it's like uh, this will happen. This is real thing. I love the uh, Walker Bulldog. It was on point. I've driven that vehicle in real life, and you guys did an amazing job on the interior. Of that. <laughs> Thanks, Jordan. Um, Don, were you going to say something? Yeah, I forgot that there was a. We were doing the turn to keep things orderly. I was going to say, can I cheat with three answers? Go ahead. The first time was when I started playing on the map, and then I fell behind in my duties. The second time was when I played the campaign with you, and it was the very first time I played the mission, and it felt like I was actually being hunted by the AI as opposed to they were just going somewhere. And the third time was when I played Mike Force and fell even further behind in my duties and couldn't stop playing it. <laughs> yeah. Great. Thank you, Don. Playing the game the first time with these guys was yeah, really no, amazing it's interesting. for me. From our side, Jack Tobin was a, a member of the Mike Force. And one day he introduced me to a, a general. He goes, General, I want you to meet Tilt. He was in Saad. Those guys ran missions across the fence, and they were snooping and pooping. With the Mike Force, we hunted for those commie bastards. <laughs> so that was that was a, a veteran's opinion from the Mike Force. <laughs> <laughs> Well, that does happen, but it tends to be the other way around uh, as, as well, in the way that Spoffy's well, written the code. Jack's a great guy, and uh, but the Mike Force did. I mean, they they were a quick reaction force, and they went out on missions, and they looked for trouble, Fuck and they hurt, those, they hurt them, that's for sure. Number 10, which part of the DLC was the hardest to create, most tedious, time-consuming? That's from Basil, directed to the team. Uh, as as part of the terrain team, it, it kind of we started at the beginning and and we we really really worked it to the very end. So so it's probably the only thing that's been going on for the whole the whole duration of the project, and it's basically still going on. And the original plan was ten months, I think. For the <laughs> yeah, yeah, I think and really. It, it was also. Uh, <laughs> Well, two times smaller. So, so the original plan, I think, was ten by ten kilometers, and then at some point it it, it grew into twenty by twenty. Um, but, but really, the terrain process it, it, it encompasses the whole whole DLC in a way that everything is done with it. Missions are done with it. The the models are done with it, and the, the work on it, the terrain sets the overall scene of the of the whole dlc i, I made a sketch on new year's day 20 I see if we can pull this up 18 i think uh and then an a4 sheet and then I, I drew it in photoshop and handed it to icebreaker and then he came back with the the uh sort of 
his version, which was which was just a, a, amazing to see the difference of you know when, when you've just drawn something on a bit of paper and then then he comes back and it's the whole coastline. Just the scale of it was, uh, oh God, what have we done? <laughs> this is too big. <laughs> we're, we're, we're all gonna die. You know. Yeah. Okay, so that's the end of that question. Next um, one. Yep. All right, number 11. Uh, again, this is for the team. Did you ever get to use Arma's quirks to your advantage? And that is from Republic of Pixels to the team. One for you, Spoff. So when we were testing, um, we, we just have to, we added with stand module. There was this bug that I think still occasionally happens where the AI will just double tap you when you're down on the floor and just finish you outright. They'd run up to you and, you know, they might just pop you in the face with a son off. And <laughs> it was absolutely not intentional. Um, as far as I can tell, there's no way that the code should do that. But it still does, I think. And uh, that was always a lot of fun. Um, mostly just hearing people complain in voice whenever it would happen. <laughs> The, the outrage at being executed, mm -hmm. yeah. Oh, I actually just remembered one. This was actually uh, very early on of campaign missions where you were testing the trackers. And I guess you guys still remember that if you lay down on the ground and not move at all, the enemy would just stay all, all over you, like on top of you, and they wouldn't do anything because yeah, they couldn't see you. <laughs> that was yeah. a good one. In the tracker module, there's this uh, mechanic where they they're being led onto the mines you've placed. So we didn't want the mines <laughs> to be too effective. So initially, I was thinking we should make uh, them go on top of the mines random, but there was like no need to code anything because uh, our map of finding and waypoints are not so precise. So they might step on the mine, but they don't do so. It was like free functionality you know, it's it's kind of random to do the pathfinding yeah that, i guess that means you, you still get trackers coming after you they don't always yeah. hit your toe poppers and and it makes for a bit more tension in the design but we didn't design it like you say it just happened yeah no yeah, initially i just made them go on top of the mines and wanted to see how how it will work out if it will be too effective or not but it turned out it's not too effective because our map of finding all right next question Running out of time. Did you ever use armor? Oh, sorry. Next what, one. Are oh. what are the major differences between developing a creator DLC and a regular workshop mode? I guess I'll answer this one because I can do it fast. I, I could do this one quickly. So basically, quality has to be high. Um, you know, visually, but also in the execution. Um, so, so in terms of its um, optimization and the optimization of all the assets, uh, because uh, you also don't have the time to spend like you have on a mod. You have to finish things and move on to the next thing uh, because time is money um, uh, for the team because we're all investing in the game and we're wasting each other's money if we basically spend too long on things. So, um, the I guess. Um, it has to make total sense, you know, to everyone around the world, which is always a bit tricky sometimes, uh, especially the translation and the and naming things. Um, and it has to stick within the PEGI rating and, and be backwards compatible. So there's a whole bunch of things there that, uh, uh, you know, from the project director's chair, that's the things I'm kind of beating everyone over the head with every day uh, in terms of <laughs> it has to be this and it has to be that. And they're going, but why? You know, but because it, uh, yeah, because it has to be, it has to be a, a paid product, um, it has to be done at a quality that you don't you don't need to worry about in your hobby project. I think I think that pretty much answers that one. Okay, yeah. number thirteen is directed to the team. It's the question came from Sumac one two two. If you could add one feature to Arma, what would it be? Frames. Yeah. Uh, that's frames per second. So, so yes. better, 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 better <laughs> optimize. More horsepower, as Don Hassey calls it. Mm. Yes. Um, yeah. I got one. Go, ahead. Go on, Don. A situational interaction key that will open a door or let you climb ladder depending on how close you are to the object instead of having to scroll through the menu <laughs> for everything. Oh. Yeah, same for me. I would not add a feature. I would remove the feature, the dumb scroll menu, and replace it with something more intuitive. 
Yeah, nobody likes planting mines on on a, a no, casualty in the arsenal, on their spawn, or on, on the helicopter, helicopter. Ev everywhere. Yeah. All right. Uh, what's this? What's this button? Touch off. Uh, goat, you had one. <laughs> yeah, I, I was going to say underground <laughs> structures exactly. because those are neat and they, they would be very cool. On yeah, we kind of worked around that with our tunnel system, and we yeah, never. Yeah, yeah, but I, I, I love yeah. to have like a proper system on there. We never knew if it was going to work, and we were amazed when it did. So well done to you and Jack for that. For those, um, I'd say let's end the sausage party. We need female characters. Um, you know, the VC had a whole army of female soldiers and couriers and stuff. And we can't represent them in the game, so it'd be good if we could. All right, yeah. moving right along. What era? What Vietnam era song do you like the most? This is from Supernova mm. to the team. Oh. Well, I know you like uh, Fire by Arthur Brown, right? Fire, and then That's in the early one. days, before I heard that song, the all-time favorite was The Animals. We gotta get out of this place if it's the last thing we ever do. <laughs> <laughs> That's cool. Um, you know, we nearly got Arthur Brown's Fire song, and the, the, um, the licensing laws are such a nightmare on Steam Workshop. Uh, we couldn't do it, even though Arthur really, really wanted. He, was, he loved the idea, and he really was. They kept contacting us, even, even not that long ago, saying, please, you know, use our track. And we can't, because the lawyers, you know, the way the system is, you just can't, we, we can't use a commercial track in the game. Uh, because of the way the, the the store is licensed, and that sucks. Because I really wanted to get Tilt song in in the game. I know the damn blood sucking ambulance chasers. Yeah, yeah, too right. Yeah, and then hey yeah. Joe, I shot my woman down. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely, that's why we want the female characters. Yeah. So, um, yeah, Whip, you had one, I think. I had a couple of time has come today from Chamber Brothers and the Sky Children from uh, Kaleidoscope. I mean, I could put a, like a whole playlist of favorite songs, but I chose this one. Yeah, I, I've actually got Tilt's playlist um, from which Jez put up on Spotify. Uh, you know, um, Geraint Jones, your friend in Wales, he, he put up a, after your podcast with him, he put up a Tilt's playlist based on all the songs you'd been talking about, I think. So I have that on my Spotify and listen to it, which is pretty cool. And you know what song was? What there was a song that came out ten years or twelve years too late. Welcome to the jungle, baby. And don't forget, you had the doors with the unknown soldier. Bullet strikes the helmeted head. He is yeah. dead. Oh yeah. And none of you guys wore helmets, so you're safe, I suppose. Yeah, we are cool. <laughs> <laughs> wow. Okay, this is from uh, Des. Eight five five nine to the team. How did the DLC Does. perform compared? Uh, probably maybe a uh, platform compared to your predictors, and how much of your wage went on hookers and blow? <laughs> this is typical Des. Thank you for that question. I think any of us spent it on hookers and blow, unless I missed. Yeah, if we had to make a party with hookers. Yeah, I did, yeah. I, think, I, did, uh, I did travel to the Netherlands after. I got paid, so. <laughs> uh, but it, it's not. It, it's not, it's it, it performed pretty well. Um, you know, it's nice to see the income coming in every quarter now, and and the guys getting paid off for all their sacrifices. That's the, that's the kind of worth. And if they want to spend it on hookers and blow, that's entirely up to them. Do you guys notice an influx of sales after the larger YouTube, Twitch content creators post a video featuring? The creator DLC, and that's from the dude to Whiplash. So, actually, believe it or not, not really. Uh, obviously, you got videos like uh, from Digby or, or the, all the streamers uh, that are actually present here. Um, you don't actually see a huge difference whenever they post videos that get a lot of views. We do get a a huge uh, influx when we have uh, discounts on Arma 3 and the DLC. It's actually happening right now, by the way. The thing is, we, we get a big morale boost from that. You know, I think Drewski uh, got uh, 650,000 views on his last... More, uh, I believe. How yeah, many? 700,000, probably, nearly, uh, at the moment. Um, 
So, so when when we see there's that many people interested to watch our game being played, um, that gives us a real big boost and, and helps us far more than money, I would say, far more than money because it keeps us it keeps us all uh, convinced well, you know that, that we're doing the right thing. I find that amazing, Rob, because it took me two and a half years with my first interview with Jocko on his Jocko podcast to get 700,000. It took me two and a half years to get 700,000 views. You guys kicked ass. Yeah, that was that, that one I think had Don Hassey in the, uh, in, in the helicopter with, with Drew uh, telling war stories. And that, that's why it blew up really big. So, Oh, he's great. got some great stories. That's for sure. Don, Don's a trooper. He, he just, you know, he turns up for the team every week and he enjoys his game with us. And he, he puts a lot of brass down range. I mean, we don't, you know, but I tell you what we did see today was we, as soon as we got on to guys and some of the others started streaming, uh, we went from 3,000 to 8,000 uh, in the donations. So that was, that was a very visible imp- uh, working with us. People are like Rotorhead stories. There's a brand new book out called We Saved Sog Souls, written by Roger Lockshear, who was in the 101st Airborne assigned to Sog. And his, it's a great book for anybody who loves Rotorhead stories. It just hit the market. We Save Sog Souls. And he has one scene where he's on a machine gun, and the cubby tells him his helicopter's on fire. He looked back and said, yeah, it's on fire, but he kept shooting until they crashed and was knocked unconscious. <laughs> great. But we're, nice. we've wandered a little bit. I'm sorry. Next question. Are we ready for next question? Yep. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Number three, how do sales... Friend, friend, trends influence your ongoing development. This is from the dude again. He's back at you, Whiplash. Um, so actually, not much, but I would point out the wish list that we made on the Software Fire forum. After we released, we obviously got a, a lot of uh, requests of stuff to do. And uh, obviously, I can't say what we're working at the moment. But uh, I would point out the civilian vehicles, for example, uh, on release, they weren't drivable, but uh, with the 1.1 uh, 1. 1 update, we, we made them drivable. So I would say the wish list, we, we do look at, at it and we try to base the decisions that we make on uh, models that were, or changes uh, on, on that a little bit. It's a big I wish just, list. But I just got that book on Amazon. As you were talking about it, cool. There's a, <laughs> there's a whole bunch of new SOG books coming out this year. We'll keep everyone posted on them as well. So, um, Tilt, you're working on a new one at the moment. Well, it, it, right now it's here. It's locked in my tiny shrinking mind. But between the podcast and the getting used to Tennessee weather, but yeah, uh, hoping to get number four gone by next month. Yeah, thank you. Uh, and Gordon Deniston, oh. Croc Three, uh, his book on. Mad Dog Shriver's due out really oh, soon. Hmm. That's going yeah. to be the one that's going to be the killer. That'll be the best of all SOG books because there's been so much. Uh, after we've done the Jocko podcast, the most uh, there's two people that I get most inquiries about. Mad Dog and Lynn Black from uh, RT Alabama before he came over to Idaho. So that yep. book will be a big hit, I'm sure. And then Dick Thompson's got his book uh, due for publishing very soon as well. So uh, we're all yeah, mad. He's hired, hired a very talented. He's hired a very talented, experienced copy editor who just happens to be. <laughs> uh, we're related. <laughs> My first daughter. What oh. single thing would you do to really boost your sales popularity? This is from Facebook. Ooh. Question. <laughs> and that's a question to Whiplash. He's picking on Whiplash now. Uh, so I, I would just say uh, more events, events like this, the charity event, or just simple things like the Mike Force events that we've been doing in the last couple of weeks. So things with the community, I think. Yeah, the word's getting out there, you know, and we, we're working. Obviously, we have Ken and Don. Sog veterans coming in to play with us and, and coming in and we have a whole string of new um, interviews coming up. We've got about 10 and then there's people like Tilt in the background with his Sog casts promoting the stories of Sog and, and creating the interest in the you just finished thing, one so, interview this week in the history, you know, so uh, all of that works together. Really We're doing more harmony. coming it's up really soon. Cool. All right. Number five, 
how can we, the community, do more to help you guys tell these stories? You're putting it out there, helping with revitalizing the community. How do we help you maintain and expand upon that? That question is from Shadow Band USA uh, Twitter, and that's directed back to you, Whiplash. You're under the gun here. <laughs> so we'll actually go back to what I just said. And yeah, the events that we do, this charity event that we're doing right now, which, by the way, we're at uh, $8,887 at the moment. Wow. Cool. We're getting wow. close. We're actually over $9,000 oh. with the last three. Did someone just, just donate? We're, um, yeah, we're, we're about to under 1000 to unlock the PC. Oh, my God. Yeah, we are we're at 9057 right now. Yeah, oh, that, wow. So the PC giveaway is unlocks at, a, at uh, the goal. Fantastic. So yeah. somebody's going to win that SOG PC today. Uh, with Tilt's wow. with Tilt signature and Ken's signature and, and Dynamite right. Dick. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's pretty cool. All right. Um, uh, yeah, nice one. Okay, I guess that was answered. <laughs> uh, as we started like 15 minutes late, are we good to, to roll 15 more minutes or will, will Dolly have a fit? We're uh, good. I, I feel like I'm not, no. Okay. Well, let's All try right. to speed up a little bit. So we, yeah. We okay, we'll speed it up. We're going to go to terrain questions now. Uh, were there often map prototypes planned as an alternative to Cam Low Nam? That's from Supernova to Horrible Goat. So we, we actually touched that this a bit earlier with the with the sketch images. So so basically no. Uh Cam Low Nam was the main idea and there were not really any alternatives, unless Rob had something in his head way before the sketch. But but those never were like in on on the table. Um, only thing that that changed really was the overall refinement, of course, but but also the size, which became, uh, grew from ten by ten kilometers to a twenty by twenty kilometers area, just so that we could fit in all the stuff. That was wanted, and and that's actually not twice as big. That's four times as big as a. Oh square. yeah, yeah, true. Sure. Yeah, it's actually a four times bigger map. So, you know, you might add a little bit on, but because of the squaring bit, you finish up. Okay. Besides number three, besides the most <clears throat> well-known real-world locations that are present in the maps, the SOG FOBs, Hamburger Hill cities, etc. What are some other lesser-known real-world locations? that are depicted in the maps? Uh, I'll answer that quickly then. So the Plain of Jars in Laos, which we added because it was fun and it's a World Heritage Site, and Halong Bay, which is an insanely beautiful limestone rock formations off the coast of North Vietnam. Of course, it's miles away from anyone's AO uh, in real life, but uh, we just had to put them in there because they're so beautiful and uh, really enjoy them. Um, did the settings for the DLC start as Vietnam War in general and shift towards Mac V Sog? Or vice versa? Did it start with Mac V Sog and meant the focus of the DLC team and his campaign? Yeah, it was Mac V Sog since the beginning. Yes. When that's I joined the, the team, it was, it was, uh, we have planned a lot more missions, but every one of them was Mac V Sog. Yeah. Mac V pretty special. Uh, I think in the original proposal was that dedication you've seen, Tilt, that we wrote to, to Sog, Veterans, Airmen, Indige. And also the uh, the quote from Lynn Black's WTF book um, yeah. about why he fought in SOG and his SOG family, um, and that and you know that really was the beginning of what we what we set out to do, and it's the middle and it was the end. All right, very good. That was that question was from Snafu. He he also asked uh, Rob. This is for you. Is there any particular significance behind RT Raleigh's name? Yeah, so so basically, uh, RT Columbia is the main uh, team in the in the in the campaign, and Rally is the backup team for Brightlight. And uh, the what we had to do was come up with a way of fictionalizing Sog recon teams um, without pointing to real ones. And so, just like Sog choosing states, we chose cities uh, around Fort Bragg, North Carolina. All right. Speaking of the campaign story, what did not make it in? This is from Sharp to Veteran. 
Yeah, so basically, uh, many missions, uh, as I mentioned earlier, we've planned, I think, 16, 16 missions. But only six made it because when we started making them, it was obvious that it's a lot more work than we expected. Uh, voice acting, the polishing of the missions, everything costs a lot of time. No kidding. Wow. So, yeah, we, we planned 16 missions initially. I want to right, so we, which mission we skipped because it's possible we still might do some of them. Yeah, we could probably rule out a POW camp raid because yeah. uh, the SOG veterans asked us not to do it because it, they didn't feel it was right to depict a successful POW raid uh, because you know, one was never successfully done by SOG and they didn't want us to, to, to distort history. That's right. Fair, isn't it, and yeah, and don't forget too, we had a recon team that was going in to a American POW camp and the NVA came on the radio and said, we know where you are. Stop or we'll kill all the Americans here right now. And then one zero turned around and went home. What's coming next to Mike Forrest game mode? This is from that guy with the poor uh, sign-in name, Facebook, to, to Spuffy. Yeah, so we got a bunch of stuff planned um, over the next few months in Mike Forrest. So we're trying to make the gameplay a bit less repetitive, a bit more dynamic, because it gets a little samey by the time you reach the end. So we're working on a on a gameplay director to uh, push back against the US forces and try and give some new situations and uh, different types of combat for the players. We've got some new scouting mechanics coming in to sort of address the balancing issues between air and ground and get them working to, together a bit more. Some new buildings, like we've got docks coming in so we can actually spawn in some boats and get some uh, nasty boats growing up and down those rivers that are miles away from the airbase. Uh, we got a full UI overhaul coming at some point, um, which will just because the task roster is not fantastic. It just we're just tearing the whole thing out and building it from the ground up again, and and hopefully that and the support menu will all be way more usable then. The sort of ground and air vehicles we're bringing a scoped in scoped down version of that in because, as we talked about earlier, getting any kind of proper pathfinding and armor is a nightmare, um, and a spike team as well. Um, we've got a design in place for that, so that's pretty exciting. Some people say that the creator DLC focuses too much on spec ops. Why aren't there more tanks and planes in Prairie Fire? Uh, and what do you have to say to that, Tilt? <laughs> um, there weren't that many tanks, and we did use a lot of planes, but it's really hard to depict that. And the planes that have been, and the helicopters, air assets that have been depicted to date, by the team, they've done an incredible job. And uh, three years invested already. Um, give a little time, they'll get there. Yeah, thanks. And, and, and that's the answer. I mean, <laughs> yeah, yeah. We, we did a vertical slice. So you do one of everything. Um, so you can test the technology, the physics, the coding, you know, the, uh, the animations, everything. And that was really what we aimed to do while getting the campaign and terrain done. And, and then basically once all that's out, we can then turn our, ta turn our attention to uh, fleshing out what you call the horizontal slice, which is to add more variants and more options. And that's what we're doing now. So but we can't tell you, or we'll have to send Tilt round to kill you. Uh, all right, just... well, update <laughs> one, one. Originally Kidding. planned with more content like new vehicles. Again, this is Supernova. Back to you, Rob. He really wants his vehicles. So... Um, it does. Uh, we, did, we did put new civilian vehicles in 1.1 release. Um, and, uh, oh, Temp has made a whole new case and terrain, you know, and 12 by 12 kilometers of terrain, which he managed to knock out in about six months. So so we dropped that in as a, free, as a freebie uh, along with seals. Really? Uh, oh, yeah. So there was a whole lot of stuff that went in. Uh, but vehicles take a hell of a long time to finish. So so that's why there's not so many vehicles dropping in that in that particular update. It was and then what are we doing? You mentioned SEAL teams. What's going on with the SEAL team side of it? Right. So basically, we have SEAL teams, and um, there's there's the Naval Advisory Detachment that we're uh, uh, with SOG at um, at Da Nang, um, and then there's the um, there's De Detachment Bravo who were operating uh, up around the uh, the Cambodian border in, around the Delta, but further up on the border. Um, and then there's the actual SEAL Team 1 teams um, who were based down at Sea Float, places like that, in the, in, right off the edge of the Delta. So we've made all of those guys. You know, they're, all, they're all playable, and they've got all their different custom weapons, stoners and Uzis and all kinds of stuff. 
Right. Uh, and, just- uh, and the UDT, sorry, the UDT as well, the scuba guys. So the first yeah. time I think they've ever been depicted in a video game or probably even in a movie or something, you know, actual seals in UDT gear, which is pretty cool. So they look like they're out of a James Bond movie, those beaver wetsuits. You mean with all the seal movies that are out there, they never depicted it that way? I don't think they've done any real good Vietnam ones, right? It's it's uh, oh, that's a good question. There's so many seal movies, I just don't have time to watch them all. <laughs> but on a, serious, on a serious note, at very early days, there were seals assigned to recon teams at Contoon in the early days of SOG, and uh, so we have to give them credit for that. And then they uh, there were two seals that earned medals of honor. Uh, up in North Vietnam, on, one of which was the uh, film Bat 21, which the movie, of course, was completely inaccurate, but uh, it was based on that mission. Fantastic. So what we're on to, I think, one of the last questions or so, getting close. Yeah, we that's are that's close, one. and maybe we could end this question with Basil. What is something in the DLC you're really proud of, from Basil to the team? Like, in the whole DLC, it's got to be Dennis' sounds again. It's so immersive. Every single sound from the helicopters to the guns are just so damn satisfying. Um, I really did come up the best, I think. Don, can we ask you next? Someone who mostly likes to ferry around in the sky, I'm going to have to say Dennis' sounds as well, because I love me a good whine of the, and beating of the rotors. Yeah, I mean, he did such a good job of those that uh, we gave Dick Thompson a flashback when when he was watching the uh, watching the team uh, play the mission, and he said he could smell the JP four when we climbed in the King Bee. So that was pretty cool. Um, and uh, who, who, uh, Goat, how about you? Uh, well, the terrain naturally, because it's it's awesome, and the team did so so good job with it. Uh, and then on, on on my own work yeah. and fun things and, and proud things uh, uh, was the animated ammo belts because it's a weird feature that just happened to work. So what we did there was we took the um, animation system that's used on the uh, on the tank tracks to make the UV uh, animate, and we put it onto the the uh, armored am- ammunition belts feeding the M60s in the helicopters and the miniguns. And so you can see all the bullets whirring by. And we never knew if that was going to work um, because it's on a, a weighted moving system of, of uh, you know, flexible. Uh, it's not like just a tank track, which is a single loop. It's something that moves around and bends and distorts. Um, and and I, I almost gave up hope about four times while you were designing that. And, total credit to you uh, for pushing it through and getting it over the line because we all absolutely loved it you know um uh whiplash yourself uh the snakes and the screen oh yeah you said that yeah 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 okay and the, the, and the screenshots because uh yeah. i believe i made so far over 600 screenshots and that's only the ones that were published because the end or more <laughs> so yeah. probably that because it, it took me a, a lot to make them yeah, you did a fantastic job of those, and 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 you, you know, we always under so much pressure when we get to release dates because there's so much to get uh, so, sorted out for those. Um, but you know, there's very little rework because you you have such a good eye for, um, for you know, setting the pictures up and composing it's them. It's easy with the assets that our guys make. True. Yeah, yeah they all look good. So um, for me, it's the memorial to Sog. Um, at the end of Eldest Son, we added Staff Sergeant Richard Fitz's son, uh, Richard Fitz Jr. Um, and we added Good that answer. to the end of the Eldest Son mission um, with a lovely picture of his dad in the helicopter. Um, and then at the end of uh, Oscar 8, uh, you know, penned and voiced by General Bore himself, you know, the, the well done to the team for getting through the, the what we call the motherfucker target. You know, uh, not a nice place to go and not, you know, very hard to get the team out. Um, and then, of course, it's followed up by the RT Colorado radio recording which hits us all like a sledgehammer every time we finish the mission and, and everyone i know who's experienced the end of oscar 8 mission absolutely loves that moment uh where, where it brings home like the reality of the experience of sog guys on the ground you know charlie's 50 meters on our ass you know um and john plaster's saying where do you want it where do you want it uh, azimuth and distance and he says 
50 meters north. And it's just, you know, he's snatching the words out as he's running. And that's Pat Mitchell. Um, and uh, you can just hear the absolute panic and terror as the guys are trying to separate, uh, you know, from, from the NBA who are hounding them. And we brought that into the game with their permission, you know, because Tilt helped us arrange that. Uh, that, to me, uh, is the thing we're proudest of. He still yeah. must 50 Green Berets that are missing in action today in Cambodia and Laos, in addition to the 83-plus aviators who died supporting SOG missions. So you guys have paid tribute to them with skill and unimagined uh, dedication because it's definitely the best uh, game out there in terms of the way it looks and the respect and the, you pay homage to the eight That's years so and the men until. that fought in that eight-year sequel war. Thank you. Thank you, Till. Thank you, that Till. And, so and much. Wild Carrots, I think he's planning to go out again this year to, to on, on his um, bright light uh, to continue mission. He's still looking for that jet pilot. Yeah, if he doesn't get screwed over by DPAA one more time again. Disgraceful. I'm sorry. My head broke. Kudos to him for, for, for returning to a mission in his 70s to try to complete it. Uh, that, right. which the only green friend and I know to, on, to spend 35000 of his own money to go back to complete the mission that he sent on as a recon team leader, 1970. Amazing story. A crazy guy. <laughs> well, Definitely Garrett. a guy you want on your side. All oh, right. yeah. Well, yeah. <laughs> but, well, I think, I think we've got to the end of the Q&A. Yes. We're going to go back to the mission. Yes. And uh, just like to thank everyone for tuning in and watching. Thank you all for your donations. I can't believe we made the 10K already um, mm. and off the PC. So that's that's fantastic. Thank you all for your questions. Uh, that was fab. And thank big special thanks to the team and to uh, Tilt for coming in and and uh, 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 humoring us today uh, with the, with the questions and uh, and and supporting us. And let me so tell you, Rob, it's my honor to be with your team because you guys kicked ass and took numbers, and you did it for three years. People forget that, and uh, we'll never forget it, and we, we're forever in your debt for it. Thank you.